I'd actually like, like to turn it over to, to the audience now. So I don't know if you want to, uh, if anyone wants to start thinking about asking asking questions. We'll make sure that uh, uh, that uh, that you can. But I wanted to throw one out to the to the group just to to, to start, and that was around uh, working together, working together across disciplines and and areas of focus. So between educators, uh, cultural communities, uh, immigrant communities, uh, and police. How, how do you think that we're doing so far? And maybe we can speak a little bit to the Canadian example. And then what can we do more between uh, countries? Like how can we cooperate more at the international level? Well, maybe I could start. Um, I think with respect to the Someone project, the, um, the response that we had from the Canadian government when I, when I proposed the project to them was quite exemplary because in the lead-up to awarding the, the grant, they had my team meet the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, uh, Citizenship and Immigration Canada, um, members of public safety, and we did a, a series of needs analysis with them uh, and presented what we had found uh, in terms of the issues surrounding um, uh, countering violent extremism, radicalization, and broadly hate speech. Um, so we came to a mediated understanding together as to what um, the educational sciences might be able to offer. Uh, and to be, to be quite honest, they were also very open about using the cultural industry, uh, which is where I'm situating a lot of my work, uh, in the arts itself, uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a tool, uh, which, uh, which has a fair amount of potential from within, uh, which doesn't require the kind of, um, of direction that one might expect, or the bureaucracy that one might see in other industries. So I think that's particularly good. Um, and from a, from a broader international uh, standpoint, I think these kinds of opportunities to engage with the public is important. But more importantly, it has, there has to be something, um, well, there has to be a systematic framework in place which will enable uh, the major actors to experiment. I think what happens with a project like someone is of the 10 or 11 projects, I'm expecting three or four of them to get traction at a certain point in time. And for those to feed off of some um, uh, some form of, uh, of evaluation within communities, within schools, um, we wouldn't want the other projects to necessarily die off. So there's ways in which I think we can implement those as curricula within the university itself. I'm very cognizant of the fact that a lot of these materials can be used as curriculum within teacher education programs uh, at the university, where we have a lot more latitude in implementing this. So. The, the, the question of sustainability is particularly important, um, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's something that we're constantly trying to, uh, to build. Thank you. Okay. Tammy? Well, you are up there. I would have to say the um, necessity is a good motivator for bringing down barriers between within Canada, different levels of uh, policing, whether it be municipal, provincial, or federal. So sharing information within a policing context has been difficult in, in a traditional sense. But the evolution of policing over the past 10, 15 years, just the sheer economics of it are at a, at a point where we have to share. We have to share our information, we have to communicate, we have to look to other police services for best, for best uh, practices around the world, and we have to learn from each other. So I would say that those barriers are coming down. It is slow. Um, we have to be patient with one another because we're, we are used to being siloed. And it is going to take some time, but I think us even being here today I think is an example of the willingness to want to understand how business is being conducted globally, um, more holistically than what we used to. Thank you. Um, I would say both on an international and a national level, I think we're very good at working together when we have to. So when the crisis is out, kind of connected to what you were saying, when the crisis is out, be it the refugee crisis or uh, terrorist attacks, we kind of see the um, necessity of working together. But on a more preventive, long term, before the crisis is out, I think we're still lacking. To so say, and this goes you know, on the macro, but also on the micro level. So in a school community, for instance, we'll bring in the parents, the teachers, the students, everybody when there's a crisis. But we won't work together until we have to. And I think that's the challenge. I, I totally agree that, that there's nothing like a good crisis when you <laughs> want to learn how to cooperate because then you need to do it. You cannot be, get, you cannot solve the problem alone. And that was what they learned the hard way in Brumadal and some of the other communities in Norway. And that is something we have learned now from 
now somewhere around, well, at least one, around 100 people, young people mostly going to, to Syria and Iraq. There is a crisis which the police cannot handle alone, and municipalities cannot handle alone, and we need, and parents cannot handle alone, the need to learn how to work together. And, and that's a challenge. Uh, of course, one of the challenges for the present crisis is that this is defined as a terrorist problem. And much of the information which comes in is from security services and secret services. And they cannot, this is information that cannot be shared. And that is a big dilemma. When some uh, municipalities, they know they have a lot of people, a lot of people, five, seven, ten people go to Syria, they don't know who they are, or don't know how many they are, and they need to have that information in order to, to try to prevent the younger brothers from going. Uh, but the police, local police, is not a, in a position where they can tell a municipality who they are. And, and, and uh, that is a problem of sharing information and trying to work together because some of this information is owned by the by foreign secret services which give it to Norwegian uh, police uh, or secret service in the, on the condition that they will not share it. And that's what, that's a big problem because some some places the local municipality is not to, is have to start their own intelligence work in order to find out who are have left from our community. Uh, where are the families are there any younger brothers? Uh, and and, and it's, it's stupid, but it's, it's the way this kind of, of uh, intelligent business works. And that's a dilemma for this really a, a, a problem for cooperation. Uh, uh, that, that's a big challenge in, in, domestically in Canada as well. How do you have appropriate information sharing while at the same time protecting fundamental human rights, including the right to privacy? And it's, it's, a, it's something that's always in tension about what that right balance is. Uh, that you know, in dealing with the, the issue and the threats, they don't lose the essence of what we have as as free, open, pluralistic uh, democracies that uh, that value that, uh, those uh, those principles fundamentally. Um, I'd like to turn to the uh, to the audience. I'm sure that uh, and thank you so much for staying. I mean, it's uh, it's been very good for. Uh, for us to see your engagement, so now the floor is uh, is yours. If you could, uh, I think I could take this microphone down, and maybe, uh, or if you can be fairly fairly loud when you're, if you're asking the questions, introduce yourself, and uh, and uh, if you feel like it, and uh, and ask your question to one or more or all of us here on the panel. In the back. Uh, I have a question for uh, uh, Professor Tori Bjorgo. I'm a student at the University of Oslo, and I'm uh, willing to make a research based on radicalization in Norway. According to my research done until now, almost 70 uh, youngsters are fighting in Syria. According to uh, the report of Ola Haram and uh, Gaddafi Zaman, that you're mentioning also in your report from Nupi. And my question, uh, I actually have two. Has Norway been implementing any internet or social media policies? And uh, to what extent uh, are these policies or have been uh, uh, effective until now? I uh, can at least not answer the second one because <laughs> I don't know how effective they are. There, there have been effort by the Norwegian police to be more present at the inter on the internet, being more present in, in, uh, in um, uh, social media, uh, they operate with an open profiles, telling clearly that they are the police, or the criminals, um, and, uh, and also, of course, I would assume that the police security service is, is uh, doing some surveillance on, on so in social media without uh, displaying who, who they are. Um, and uh, we know that they do pick up people who, or, or, or detect people who, for example, uh, make a lot of threats. Uh, sometimes they, uh, the, the police security service are visiting these people and talking to them and, and trying to clarify whether they are dangerous or not and trying to get them to stop. That is one way which has been often quite effective. Um, I, we, we, I do not have knowledge and information now about to what extent they are able to stop, for example, people who start to talk about going to Syria, whether they are able to, to inter, uh, intercept them and, and, and talk to them. 
and talk them out of it. Uh, this is something that the security service knows more, more about than they don't want to tell me uh, how effective that is. Uh, what they say is that it's often not effective. That they sometimes they they uh, realize that that by contacting these people they sometimes uh, just radicalize them further. So that is that is sometimes counterproductive. Sometimes uh, that is a dilemma. But they do um, have. Um, both open profiles and probably also closed door or secret profiles on, on the on social media in order to to see what's going down there. The, the idea is that that the, these social media are like streets. That's where police should have some kind of presence because there are private areas where the police cannot go in, either because they don't have the password or because there is a limit to privacy. And and uh, we have seen tendencies that some of these are closing themselves in much more than they did once. But where they are open and public, the police try to be. But of course, the, 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 the internet is pretty big, so <laughs> it's not so easy. Other questions? Yeah, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's one goes to a tool again, I hope it's a tool. Uh, I'm a student at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Good. Yeah. Norwegian University of Life Sciences. And my question is, it has to do with the SLT model that you talked about. I want to know how do you get the trust and, and confidence between the police and, and the local communities in, in combating the problem that we see in Norway? Because I believe if the trust is not very strong, uh, it, we cannot have a very effective preventive or battle. How do you get the trust? It's an interesting and good question because uh, what we know that in general, in the kind of main, main population in Norway, the trust in the police is very high. But in parts of the population, the trust is very low. And part of the reason is that quite a lot of the, of the minority population come from countries where they have every reason not to trust the police because the police is corrupt, it's brutal. And it's uh, it's uh, not it's not your friend, so to put it lightly. Um, and of course, some of these experiences will will also color the, the experience of, of uh, uh, some of those immigrants in Norway, and and people have have stayed there for a short time. But still, there is also something about how they experience the police in Norway, and it's not always positive. I mean, the police has. Um, uh, some police officers are very good at dealing with minorities, and some are not. And some do, do uh, excellent jobs in, in winning the trust of, for example, young people of a minority background, and others treat them in ways which they are kind of automatically seen as suspect. And, and of course, this is something which is undermining trust in the police. So it's, it's uh, a huge job for the police and for police education and for police leaders and for every police officer to try to to deal with minorities in a better way than, than at least some parts of the police have done until now. I think but again there are a lot of a lot of very good police officers in that respect and some who are not so good. So it's a it's a the problem is what kind of experience do people remember? Uh, do they remember those who dealt with them in a fair and nice way, or do they remember those times when they were accused of having, having stolen a bicycle, or they, they were checked their IDs every uh, second day? These kind of experiences tend, the negative experiences tend to undermine much more than what you can build up through ten positive encounters. So that is that is a problem. That the bad experiences tend to 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 cause uh, a lot of make a lot of impression in the memory. Thanks. Um, I think there was a question just behind. Uh, why don't you go ahead? Uh, yeah. Me? Yeah, yeah. 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 Very well happy. And then... Yeah, my name is Afshin. I'm a journalist. I have actually two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, have you ever tried to go to down there, to the Iraq or Syria, to meet up those who, who, uh, who are in prison in Iraq or Syria? and to meet them and to interrogate them, because there are a lot. Uh, I've been in Syria for a month ago. I was in Syria, Iraq, so I was in, I met uh, 
Secret Service of Yepege, who is the Kurds, and he's told me that there is uh, 1,600 who, uh, prisoners from Iceland. So who can you can find Norwegian, Swedish? I met a Swedish in Iraq, in North Iraq. There is a Swedish guy who uh, went down there to fight with Iceland. Uh, so there is a lot of them. Have you ever tried to do this? No. To go? no. <laughs> I, uh, I don't look good in order to so. <laughs> No, it's a, I mean, it's, there is it's a, a dangerous place to go. So I, I, and I'm, I'm, um, uh, so I, I'm not gone there. No, that's true. No, I'm just, I'm the second one. Uh, I've been in uh, uh, a lot of asylum attacks, the, the refugee camps. Uh, la uh, yeah, it was yesterday. I met, uh, I just, in uh, one of the refugee camps here, I met a guy, talked to him, he was from Halab and this area, who was ISIL. He, he had a lot. And you can see his uh, thinkings and his ideology. He told me about, about how the ISIL is. I tried to go to, to, to interfere or to intervene in these camps and to find who really get extremists or who are not. Because they are maybe dangerous for the future of Norway or Europe. That's a task for the police, not for me. You are, you are not a I'm not a police, I'm a researcher. He's a researcher. Oh, he's a researcher. Yeah. So I'm, uh, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting, those are both interesting questions, I think, for practitioners. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of how do you engage and find the appropriate uh, information so that you can develop the right, right kinds of strategies. And while you know, perhaps uh, going to visit some of those, the, the first question that you had in terms of the, the camps and, and the prisons in Syria is quite frankly off limits. Uh, for many in, in the West, for a variety of reasons, not least of which is the fact that uh, I think none of our governments have, have embassies or any kind of support there, to the fact that the security situation is so precarious that we would actually put, be putting people's uh, lives in danger, and that would be in, inappropriate from a, from a governmental uh, point of view. But I think engaging and trying to understand uh, motivations, behaviors, and, and understanding the, the, the threat is something that security services of, and you know, police of all uh, stripes are, are working on to understand uh, what the uh, what the threat threat may be. But I think that the, what we were trying to, to do here is look at this from a broader perspective as well, in terms of what happens within our own uh, uh, countries as well. I mean, for for as a Canadian, if I could, if I, I think uh, um, Paul put out some uh, some interesting uh, statistics and some interesting examples. Of, uh, of, of homegrown, if I could use that, uh, terrorism. And I think for many Canadians, um, many didn't know that until September 11th, the, the, the single most devastating terrorist attack was the, the bombing of Air India, with, where approximately 300 uh, people were killed. And this was a plot that was planned and executed in Canada by Canadians. Uh, and it wasn't until many, many years later that many Canadians perceived this as a, an attack against India, but it was one that killed hundreds of Canadians. And it was the fact that we didn't acknowledge and recognize some of the challenges uh, that we face within our own countries that you might turn a, a blind eye to what can be a real, a, real, a real threat. And that's why having a broad approach that looks at a range of issues and engages a wide range of actors to deal with the complexity of the problem is important. And while we have to do our due diligence, absolutely, to make sure that when we're bringing in refugees into our countries that we do uh, understand the potential, uh, you cannot uh, make the assumption that the people who are running away from groups like, like ISIL are, are coming to countries like Norway and Canada uh, to perpetrate uh, uh, attacks. I think we have to be careful in how we, how we pursue this in a way that doesn't, in the case of many refugees, victimize them a second and third and third time. That's just not good. Um, Can I, think I just ask a question yeah. about the Canadian? Is it okay for the Canadian to go down there and fight against ISIL? Because so, there is a lot of Canadians there. There are. I think there have, been, there have been Canadians who have been killed in, uh, in, yeah. in, in, uh, in particular work uh, with the Peshmerga. Some of them was afraid to, to yes. run to you. And but the, in, in, under, the Canadian, in, uh, under Canadian law, you cannot join a listed or support a listed terrorist organization. So joining a listed terrorist organization, regardless of its, uh, of its disposition, regardless of who they are talking, is a criminal offense. And uh, I think that, that looking at this phenomenon of people traveling abroad 
to engage in, in, in fighting for various organizations is something that uh, you know, governments have looked at and looked at, 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 uh, at carefully. Uh, and again, if, for example, if they join a listed organization like the PKK, uh, which is a listed organization uh, in, in Canada, that would be illegal in the, in the, Canadian, in the Canadian context. What about EPK? Well, I, mean, I don't want to go like sort of like you know case by, case by case. I think that the general uh, you know recommendation from the government of Canada will be do not go. Uh, it is a bad idea. Uh, and, you know, uh, as somebody who used to be the director general for security and intelligence, uh, part of my job was to inform uh, people what the risks were to their well-being, and uh, I would never ever recommend anyone. Uh, who's a Canadian citizen to travel to that part of the world, regardless of their motivation. I think that Canadians ha ha can contribute to addressing the challenges in a number of ways through humanitarian work. Uh, our our uh, government is involved in, for example, training and working closely with, uh, with, uh, with the Kurdish re regional government on training. Those are the types of things that I think Canadians can channel their, uh, their, their wish to counter uh, organizations such as, uh, such as ISIS, Daesh, or whatever. But, uh, um, going and as an individual, uh, strongly, strongly discouraged, and in some cases, just downright illegal. So there's a question in the back over there. And then... Better start from the whole post center. I know we're out of time. It's just one. It's always interesting, but a bit challenging to follow discussions with, when you cover quite a lot, for, from educationalists to the police. And I just wanted to challenge the panel, probably our international national guests uh, first. Or something. Uh, what are the strengths in? the educationalist uh, approach to uh, CDA, what are the strengths of the police approach to the CDA? Or are these the same? And what are the differences of the, of, uh, the approaches to the whole problem? In comparison with the... I'm not, I just want to well, with each other? Like comparing the, the educational approach versus the policing approach? Yeah, or is there a difference? Are we... Uh, just to elaborate, mm -hmm. it's five bucks of it. Uh, uh, we cooperate for two reasons. One is sharing information, and the other one is that we have different strengths. So I wonder, and I'm, a, I'm in the education field, I have a very strong feel of uh, what would be my strengths in dealing with CVA. And I also have a very strong feeling of what, what I have absolutely no idea about. And I wanted to hear that also from, from the panel. Would you see uh, the education list, or what's happening in the classroom? Is there, is there anything that can happen there that the police couldn't do? Is there anything the police could, you can do that, that the educationalists couldn't do? To your point, it's, it's why we work in partnerships. That's why, right? It's why we work hand in hand with educators, with social workers, with mental health specials. We don't have the answers or the expertise for, for that world. And, but we do have areas of expertise of recognizing criminal intent, of understanding patterns of behavior that can lead to, to problems. So it, it's really complementary. We, that's our strength that we bring to the table. We bring a leadership role to the table. Uh, we are really good at um, motivating governments and activating, you know, supporting our community partners and their needs. So we, we throw our support behind different things. But when it comes to actually the developing of the curriculum, the getting into the classrooms, we rely on professionals to do that and we work hand in hand with them. So our strength really is in partnership. Thanks. Uh, we have time for one more. Uh, our members of our panel actually have to, to, to go as well. So, one more question. Uh, Don Guedes, please, from um, Conflict Resolution Program in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And uh, primarily to represent from Calgary. Um, you very early on pointed out the uh, importance of context, contextuality. And if misunderstanding or seeing out of context also has victimized people who otherwise would not be in danger of radicalization. Sounds like this has something that has happened. Could you elaborate a little bit on it? That is this something that has actually exacerbated our problem that otherwise would not have been there? Yeah, and, and uh, the where that comes from is, is uh, when, I, when I go and talk about redirect, and, and well, the big question that comes up every time is, what should we be looking for? What are the what are the indicators? You know, what 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 tells you that a radical uh, a person is becoming uh, a radical? Well, the reality of that, uh, I think it's fair to say in <coughs> academia and practitioners around the world, is there's no magic bullet for one of a very bad word to maybe use in this term. <laughs> but but the, the, there's no silver bullet or magic formula for what for what this uh, for for who's going to become a radicalized. So uh, I'll put it completely in context into, into, into where you came, uh, come from. Um, how did Jerry Adams 
go down the road he, he did and Martin McGuinness go down the road they did. Well, it's quite obvious because of the environment and the context of the world they grew, they grew up in. They probably weren't going down any other kind of uh, path in, in some way. But then, but then not everybody, not everybody that lives in the Ardoin, which is an area of Belfast, joined, joined the provisional IRA. So why does one person do it that grows up in the exact same environment and another person doesn't? And I think academia and practitioners around the world, we haven't, we haven't answered that. So, um, but we have made mistakes. Absolutely, we, we have, and and, and, that, and that's the real danger where where you perceive a behaviour or an action as an indication that somebody is going to commit an offence, and they never were, but your intervention then puts them in that direction, and that's the really sort of sensitive pogo sticking through a minefield area that we have to be really careful of and that's why from a redirect perspective we're dealing with behaviors what behaviors are making you vulnerable to radicalization we're not saying you are going to become a radical or an extremist but there are a set of vulnerabilities in your life that suggest that you are at risk so please work with us so that we can remove some of those vulnerabilities. And that may have been vulnerabilities that, that, that might have made, made them susceptible to being involved in crime or be victimised, but they're there. There's a presence of them. And by working with them to remove them, I, don't, I think it's difficult to criticise um, a, a, a goodwill and intent to try and make somebody's life better, no matter how they got there. So. Okay, um, thank you very much. I'd really like to thank the panel for your contributions. I'd also like to thank my colleagues at the Embassy, Marie-José Réon, Bjorn Hernes, and Peter Otis for organizing the event tonight, so thank you guys. And uh, mostly I'd like to thank all of you for, uh, for being here for two hours and, and uh, being engaged and asking lots of questions. This is an important issue that the Embassy will continue to work on and work on in partnership with law enforcement, government, and NGOs here in Norway, so we look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thank you very much.